Well, I'm really glad uh, to be able to be here today to talk a little bit about uh, the oath. Everybody here, if I just talk loud, yeah. Yeah. it'll be better. It'll be better for me. <laughs> it's really an honor to be able to come and just talk for a little bit about the oath. I'm a big fan of oath keepers. I remember in 2009 when uh, the organization first kind of found its roots, found some uh, structure, and they first went online. And I remember getting on. Uh, the, I think at the time it was oathkeepers.blogspot.com, and I remember going on and punching in my information and giving them my email address so I could get some of their uh, emails. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. All right, good to go. And uh, I was really excited about it because, um, you know, I was in the Marine Corps for a total of 10 years between active duty and reserve. Uh, I was with the Marine Corps from 1999 to 2009. I was discharged in 2009. And my job in the Marine Corps, I was an 0311 infantryman. So my job was like the other, is there any other infantrymen? All right, yeah, we've got some. So my job as an infantryman, was uh, everything that we did, all the training that we did revolved around killing. It was the, it's probably some of the more dangerous work in the military. Uh, we, we have the guys that we need to make sure that our, you know, they're fixing our trucks, the guys in Motor T. We have the guys in Supply that are uh, making sure that we have the appropriate uh, uh, body armor or the appropriate packs or, or, or issue. So everybody's really needed throughout all of these jobs in the Marine Corps or in the Army or in the Navy or Air Force or the Coast Guard. But the thing is, is in the Marine Corps, my job was the job that all the other jobs existed just to support. The, the, uh, the mission of the Marine Corps Rifle Squad is to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver, or to repel the enemy's assault by fire and close combat. Now, everybody in the Marine Corps exists just to support that mission. And so, uh, from 1999 to, to um, 2003, when I was on active duty, I had the time of my life. I got to deploy overseas, got to participate in operations in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, I was a Marine Corps martial arts instructor. I got to spend some time in a scout uh, team out ahead of the rest of the company, making sure we were finding the right path. Uh, I had a great time. I got to go to squad leader school, learn how to build bombs, Bangalores, set off, you know, daisy chain a whole bunch of Claymore mines together. Uh, how to how to properly set up an ambush for my squad. Got to do all that stuff. Had a great time. Unfortunately, though, right in the middle of my first enlistment was 9/11. So I quite literally went from an environment in which all we ever did was train to an environment in which all we ever did was prepare for the next real-world combat operation. My very very first real-world combat operation. Never thought I'd be doing this, but the very first time I ever put live rounds in my uh, magazine. The first time I ever went to condition one with uh, live ammunition for a real operation was on American soil. Uh, in the days right after 9-11, uh, my company was attached to provide security for Armed Forces Pacific at Camp Smith in, in Hawaii. And now these guys at Armed Forces Pacific, they were participating in a much broader uh, intelligence gathering operation, planning operation to find out where the enemies were, where the terrorists were, the guys that hit us on 9-11, the guys that bombed us or flew our planes into the towers uh, in New York City or, or in the Pentagon in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, so we went from a mission that was really a training mission to a, to a mission that was, you know, you're wearing body armor because now you really might get shot. It's not just because you might have to wear it for real one day, it's because now you really have to wear it for real because there's people out there that we've been able to identify that are trying to kill us. So in 2003, I left the Marine Corps and I went to college. Uh, right about 2004, during our presidential election, we had the one president that said I was for the war before I was against the war, right? And everybody at the time was really getting upset when they heard him say that. Well, I was no different. I was really upset with him for saying the same thing. So I went back and I started studying some documents because I was really, really angry with this guy, Senator Kerry, and he wasn't the only one. There's some Republicans who were saying the same thing. But I was really beginning to get angry with some people in government because they're saying things like, well, I'm not for the war now. Why? Because it was a hot button issue and it was election year. So what they're trying to do is they're using the blood of American troops to pander to the voter base to pick up more votes. I got a big problem with that. There were some guys in my squad who'd been killed. I had some other friends in other units that had been killed. And when I have a big problem with somebody saying that, well, I'm for the war, but wait a minute, now I'm against the war now that it's election season. The reason I have such a problem with this is because our men and women overseas that are wearing the uniform 
they don't have the luxury of deciding whether or not they're for or against attacking that machine gun bunker that day. They don't have the luxury of saying, no, you know what, platoon sergeant, I don't feel like going out on patrol today. I'd rather stay here. After all, you know, I was for it when I joined, but now I, I'm not really for it. They don't have the luxury of doing that, but all too often we got these politicians in, I almost said Jefferson City, but as far as this particular issue is concerned, primarily Washington, D.C., who feel like they have some kind of red carpet luxury to decide whether or not they're for or against what the troops are doing, the same troops that they already voted to send overseas, all right? Now, this isn't necessarily about what you believe about the wars, okay? Remove how you feel about the wars from this issue right now. Because this isn't necessarily about our foreign policy, this is about our domestic policy. And when I talk about our domestic policy, I'm not even talking about uh, domestic policy that we all use, follow, or implement, okay? I'm talking about the domestic policy that we as a culture use to decide what kind of people we're sending to Washington, D.C. That's our domestic policy, is our culture. What kind of domestic policy we're using whenever it comes election time, whenever we're deciding to find what kind of candidates we're looking for send in uh, to uh, represent us in Washington, D.C. So there's a domestic policy that's really an issue here. And the reason is, the reason we have people like John Kerry, the reason we've had people like, or, or you just name it, any one of those jokers who are, who are using the, or the, the troops as this kind of political leverage, the reason is, is because these people don't understand the oath that they took to become congressmen or senators. And now the, the oath that they took is very, very similar to the oath that we took. And uh, who here's taken the oath for military or police service before. A number of us, all right. Well, I'm gonna read the oath, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down the oath and talk a little bit about what it means, okay? I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the grammatical dynamics that go in to the oath. I think a lot of people uh, um, hear it, or they say it, but it doesn't really sink in. When I was 17 years old and I took the oath, it didn't really sink in. To me, it was just kind of a ceremonious poetic statement, you know, before you launch off into boot camp. But when you really break down the uh, the grammatical absolutes of this statement, it really means a whole lot more than uh, the credit I think that it gets from a lot of people. So let me read it and then I'm gonna break it down a little bit. Here's how the oath goes. Here's what I said in 1999. I said, I, Paul Kerbin, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over, over me according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God, okay? Now all too often, like I said before, I think a lot of people join the military, especially when you're young, and you're 17 or 18 or 19, and you join, and you're looking forward to you know, raising your right hand and saying the oath because you know that that's just, a, that's one of those like landmark moments of your military journey, you know? But I think a lot of times people just don't put the thought into it. They don't see how profound <coughs> this actually is. So let me start with the very first couple lines. I said, I, Paul Kerbin, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And as soon as the word domestic is used in the oath, it's immediately followed by a semicolon, okay? Now a semicolon, grammatically speaking, means that whatever comes next, the very next thought is only there to reinforce the first thought. That's what a semicolon is for, okay? So when I said that I would take an oath, when I took that oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic, that's really the conclusion of that particular thought. That when I take an oath, what am I taking an oath to? I'm taking an oath to the Constitution. That's what it is. And I'm taking an oath to protect the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic. See, a lot of people in America today think that we take an oath to, to protect the president. I've actually heard this from people in the military. We take an oath to protect the president. We take an oath to follow the president. We take an oath to follow whatever Congress tells us to do. That's not true at all. Oh my goodness, nothing could be further from the truth. We don't take an oath to any one person or one individual. In fact, in 1776, we fought a bloody war of independence to get away from the whole idea that we fought and served at the pleasure of an individual. We don't do that in America anymore. We fight and we serve not for the pleasure of any one individual. We fight and we serve for one purpose, one purpose only, the security of our Constitution. So I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to talk a little bit about why that's important. In America, American veterans are different and we're special than any other veteran, any other service member that's ever served in the history of the world. Up until 1776, we had people that would serve at the pleasure of a king in America, right? We served because King George III told us to. In fact, 
fact, one of the reasons that we separated from Great Britain in the first place was because in the Declaration of Independence, it actually says this. Because King George III was actually basically Shanghaiing people, okay? He was catching our sailors on ships out at sea and conscripting them into service to go fight his wars in other parts of the world. And we didn't like that. So we actually put in the Declaration of Independence one of the reasons why we're separating from, from Great Britain is because we have a single individual, King George III, who's using us to fight at his pleasure without any representation. People get a little upset over taxation without representation. How about sending your sons and daughters to war without representation? How about that? I would say, you know what, I, I think people would probably, put it in that particular context, people would probably be a lot more, uh, they'd probably feel a lot better about paying a little bit of extra money without representation, just as long as somebody didn't come along and take their son or their daughter and force them into a uniform to fight overseas in a war that we have nothing to do with and we have no representation as, you know, as to our policy. But see, that's one thing that King George III said. He said, we're going to take your people, I'm going to put them in my wars. And we said, no. Okay? So the American veteran, we're special and we're unique because in the Declaration of Independence, we formed a country through the principles of the Declaration of Independence that said, we're not going to, we're not going to have a country for the sake of a king. We're not going to have a country. Governments aren't instituted to help generate more wealth for an individual or for an empire. In America, we're instituting a government for the sole protection of our rights and our liberty and our god given natural rights. That's why we have a country. Because governments are created, second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. The only reason we have a government is to secure these rights. That's it. So the military, being a branch, not a branch, but an arm of our government, exists for one reason and one reason only, to secure our God-given liberty. So when Barack Obama, or any other president for that matter, decides to unilaterally take our sons and daughters and send them into Libya, or Nigeria, or any one of these countries that he's recently sent troops into, without any representation, I would have to make the argument that we've probably come full circle on that issue and that, that our founding fathers are but for the, sake of, for the sake of fairness, I'm going to say that Barack Obama is not the only one to have done this. Republicans have done it as well. And that's why it's important for, our, for us as individuals to make sure that we're always on guard and not feel some kind of false sense of security because we got somebody in there who has an R or a D next to their name. Because our troops swear an oath to the Constitution, not a political party. And I would say that it's incumbent upon every American to make sure that we breach that party line for the sake of constitutional adherence, Amen. okay? So it's very important. It's not just about party, it's about the Constitution. Amen. Let me go on a little bit further to where our, to where our oath says next. I solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic. I think I could make the argument that anybody who works to subvert our Constitution or undermine the principles or the law of our Constitution, anybody who works to undermine our Constitution immediately falls into the camp of an enemy of the Constitution. Yes. Okay? This isn't, this, it doesn't matter if you're wearing a Nazi uniform, and it really probably doesn't even matter, maybe, according to the oath, if, if, if I have this correctly, if you have somebody in office in American government who works to undermine the Constitution, I think there's a good argument that somebody could make that they would be considered a domestic threat to the security or the integrity of the Constitution. Agreed. So I think that we need to be very, very careful when people start talking about, oh, well, I took an oath, and so just because I took an oath, I can go do whatever I want because I took an oath. Taking an oath doesn't mean that you have license to do whatever you want. Taking an oath means that you're humble enough to respect the authority of the Constitution. That's what taking an oath means. But I think sometimes in America we have it a little bit backwards where people take an oath and think, now I can do no wrong. I've got some cover because I took an oath to the Constitution, and I'll just fall back on that and tell people like, hey, I took an oath, everything's fine, I took an oath, right? But maybe we need more of those people taking a vow to be oath keepers instead of just a vow to use that oath as some kind of political cover to do whatever they want. Here's a good example, and we'll get back on the oath here in just a second, but here's a really good example. We recently found out, right, that uh, our, the United States government has been um, 
getting warrants, secret warrants, being issued by secret judges and secret courts to secretly spy on the communications of the American citizens. Now let's think about this. You're to, I'm, I am, by every, if the Marine Corps would have issued me nails in the morning and said eat these for breakfast, I would have done it. If the Marine Corps would have said I want you to eat mud for lunch, I would have done it. I was that Marine. I was the Marine that all the other Marines in my platoon hated because I was like the, I was like the kid in school who's like, uh, teacher, I think you forgot to collect our homework and everybody else hated that kid. I was that kind of Marine, all right? They met you outside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But here's, but let's, so let's think about this, okay? I take it very seriously, going after the enemies of America. I do. But I also take very seriously the liberty that America is supposed to secure to me as a sovereign individual. So if the government needs information on the American people, there's a process for that that the founders have put in place in, art, in I'm sorry, in Amendment 4 of the Bill of Rights. They have to have a warrant, okay? But here's the problem. They think that they need a warrant to protect them, not us. So they say, oh, what's the story broken? We all found out that our communications have been confiscated and shared. They said, oh, it's okay, because we got a warrant from the Department of Justice. It was a secret warrant. It was issued by a secret judge, but it was a warrant. But here's the problem. Warrants were not put in the Bill of Rights to protect them. They were put in the Bill of Rights to protect us. Whenever they get a warrant because they feel like they need information about us, whenever they want to confiscate our property or, or violate our privacy, they need to show us the warrant to prove to us that due process said, I'm sorry, due process has been applied for the protection of my liberty. That's what a warrant's for. It's a warrant to show the person that you're about ready to go get the property or confiscate them as a person and detain them. The warrant is to prove to them that your government is being respectful of your liberty. That's what a warrant's for. So if you're gonna issue a warrant secretly, the confis from a secret judge, well, that warrant kind of undermines, doing it in secrecy kind of undermines the whole purpose of having warrants in the first place. It's a violation of liberty. It might not necessarily be a violation of the loopholes that they've created, but it would definitely, most necessarily, that and doing it that way is a violation of the fundamental principles of liberty and transparency and accountability, just to name a few other issues. So we need to take really into deep, deep, deep consideration. When we're going after the enemies of America, are we violating our constitution to do it? Or are we following the spirit of the law and the letter of the law in order to keep us free. You see, when I remember when I had my first anti-terrorism class in Marine Corps boot camp, they said that terrorists, what makes a terrorist a terrorist is these are people that do acts in order sometimes just to scare people into submission, right? And all I've heard from politicians in Washington, D.C. is these people hate us because we're free, right? So if they really hate us because we're free, if that's really why they're attacking us, then maybe what we should do is protect our freedom and liberty so they don't wind up inadvertently by default winning because we've traded our security, I'm sorry, we traded our liberty for security. Benjamin Franklin warned us, he said, those who trade their liberty for security deserve neither and will lose both. I, would, I think that we can make the argument in a world of TSA body, naked body scans, in a world of drones, our government has already issued a study because they would like to acquire 30,000 drones using domestic airspace. Mm -hmm. I think that with some of the policies that we're seeing come our way that we can make the argument that we've traded our liberty for security and in the process have entirely undermined the principles of liberty and the Constitution. And maybe now more than ever we need people to stand up and say, hey, I took a note to the Constitution. Um, maybe we should go back and reflect on that a little bit. Maybe we should go back and consider what the Constitution means. You see, I remember when I took a note to the Constitution, it took me till 2004. It took me five years before I thought to put any insight into what exactly that means. It took some of my friends being killed before I thought that I would reconsider exactly what that oath meant. And I, I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed to tell you that as a sergeant in the Marine Corps in 2001 or 2002 or 2003, if somebody asked me to define liberty and talk about what liberty and freedom is, I'm embarrassed to admit that I would probably give an extremely shallow answer. I probably would have said something like, oh, it's just doing whatever you want to do. That's probably what I would have said. But there's a whole, there's, there's a whole other level, there's a whole deeper philosophy behind liberty. It's just like socialism and, Mar and Marxism and Buddhism and Hinduism and any 
doctrine of beliefs it has an underlying philosophy that if people don't understand it and they can't articulate what it means, there's no way that they're ever going to know when it's being taken away from them. And right now, the American culture, the American education system, we're fostering a new generation, including the current generation that I'm a part of, that we can't necessarily define what liberty means. We have a problem articulating it. If you want to ask us what the latest movie to hit the theaters was, well, we know that. We would know that. You want to ask us what all the problems with the new iPhone 5? We'd be able to tell you all the problems with the new iPhone, right? But we couldn't tell you exactly what liberty means except for maybe saying, well, it's just doing whatever you want to do. So meanwhile, the same people who think that we have liberty, we have liberty. We really don't. Because when we have our own government violating our constitution to deprive us of our liberty for the sake of security, we just go right along with it hook, line, and sinker because we think it's okay. But, but it's really not, because it's, it, it undermines our form of government, it undermines a Republican form of government, which according to Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, every state in this union and every person is guaranteed a Republican form of government, meaning that we have a rule of law in which you have direct representation in the application of your government. We don't have a whole lot of that today. I'm going to move on a little bit to uh, the next part of the oath. Keep holding up my paper. I just talked about, I, Paul Kurtman, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, semicolon, okay, this means get ready, because the next thought entirely reinforces the first thought, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. What this means is that in the, in the process, in the whole process of supporting and protecting and defending the Constitution of the United States of America, that means that in the process of doing that, I will only bear true faith and allegiance to the same people who also swear allegiance to the Constitution. This is why we should have a huge problem as Americans when we put American troops under the control of anybody from the United Nations. Because those oh, yeah. people have not given oh, true yeah. faith and allegiance to our Constitution. And I would say that that provides a direct conflict of interest there for our form of government. And I would say that it's a violation of our oath because our oath says that we will only swear true faith and allegiance to the same people who have given their loyalty to our Constitution. So whenever we have people going down this road, oh, this idea of multi-unit operations or international operations, and we're going to send the troops in there with troops from France and Europe and South America because it's a good, feel-good mission. Well, do that. Sure, we can do that. But in order to do that, the troops would quite literally have to violate their constitution because they're not supposed to be following orders from anybody who's not given their allegiance to our constitution. That's according to the oath that they took. But so let's go on a little further now. And I'm going to keep reading through the oath as I do this. I said, I, Paul Kurtman, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Semicolon that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, semicolon, so there's another one. So what we see here is we see that these thoughts keep reinforcing the first thought, the very first thought. And the very first thought in the entire oath is a thought that says we are only here, we are only in existence, we are only organized for the security, for the defense of our constitution and our constitutional form of government. That's the primary function, that is our primary mission, as oath takers. That's our primary mission. So what's the very next one? What's the very next one that comes after that? It's this. That I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to regulations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So what this means, for all the people that think that we take an oath to the President, we take an oath to the Constitution. In fact, we're only supposed to acknowledge and, and respect the authority of the President's orders so long as those presidential orders are in compliance with the Constitution, Amen. right? And, and, and right now, exactly. understand that what I'm saying here is I'm just trying to break down, grammatically speaking, the logic of our oath. It follows logic. There is a statement. There's a thought here. There's a train of thoughts, right? And so we're only supposed to follow orders so long as those orders are geared directly towards the security of our Constitution. Mr. President, if you tell me to confiscate firearms, I'm sorry. 
but sir, you're out of line and you're out of order. Because the Constitution says that in, in, in the Second Amendment to the Constitution, that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Mr. President, that means that you don't have any jurisdiction over the issue of regulation of firearms. Amen. So as an oath taker, someone who raised my right hand and said that I'm swearing an oath to support and defend the Constitution, Mr. President, I can't follow those orders. And of course, our president, my little disclaimer here, he hasn't directly given an order to confiscate firearms. I'm talking about yeah. should this ever happen, okay? Is it heading that direction? Yes, it's heading that are you, are direction. You sure, are you sure he hasn't done it privately? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. But I when he gives a public order, he when he gives a public order, people who understand the oath and understand the Constitution need to know exactly what's at stake here. <laughs> they need to have the intestinal fortitude to stand up. If they're really an oath taker, if they really met that oath, then they need to stand up and follow through on it. Amen. And there's some orders, if they're unconstitutional, if they deprive the American people of our liberty, it's, it might very well be possible that those are wrong orders that maybe should be uh, neglected. But you see, sometimes that can be hard in America because there's a lot of political pressure. You have people that call groups like the Oath Keepers crazy radicals. You know, they come up with all kinds of names because even though they don't know you, they've never met any of you, they're willing to come out and say things to put it in the mind of the public, to immediately put it in their mind that you're not even worth listening to, okay? So this can be hard sometimes. It can be hard to follow these oaths because there's gonna be some decisions coming down from higher at some point in the future, maybe in my lifetime, maybe not, but people that took an oath and that they're serious about their liberty and they're serious about the Constitution, they're gonna have a hard time because it means they're gonna have to probably make some sacrifices. That's why the very next part of the oath there's not a semicolon. After the part that I just read, Uniform Code of Military Justice, that's where it stops. Then there's a period. The very next thing, our oath is broken down into two sentences. One sentence is the logic of our oath. The second sentence says, so help me God. That's a sentence all in its own. What that means, that's not, and, and that itself is not also just a poetic statement, so help me God. We just say that to give it some kind of extra kick. We say that because same God, according to our founders, according to our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution and the preamble, the same God who gave us life and liberty, oh, I'm sorry, as Thomas Jefferson said, the same God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. Amen. And as a, as a Christian, okay, since the oath talks about God, I'm going to talk about God for just a second, all right? As somebody who is of the Christian faith, and if you're of another faith, whatever, if we all acknowledge um, that there's at least a higher authority, okay, I believe as a Christian that God invented liberty. I believe it's God's will for people to be free. And I would think some people will probably have a really time, hard time in front of a camera, in front of public, trying to argue against the fact that people should be free. Okay? So I feel very, very comfortable saying that I believe that people should be free. And as a Christian, I believe that God wants people to be free. And as a Christian, I believe that God invented liberty just like he invented being, just like he invented the clouds and the stars and the sky. Okay? I believe it's God's will for people to be free. So this next line in the oath where it says, so help me God, that's not just a poetic statement. That's because we're supposed to acknowledge the creator and the grantor of our liberty. And we're going to him and pleading for him for help to defend the liberty of our fellow man because sometimes it can be a difficult thing to do. It's a prayer. Our whole oath essentially has turned into a prayer at this point because we're not asking our platoon sergeant, we're not asking a lance corporal or a private or a, a petty officer in the Navy, hey, help me, help me with this oath. We're asking the God of the universe, or as John Adams called him, the great legislator of the universe, please, with your divine benevolence, step in and help us protect our freedom. Help us be good stewards of the liberty that you've given to us. Help us be true and honor the oath that we just took. Amen. That's what so help me God means. It just doesn't mean, and I maybe, you know, maybe we could use a little help and I'll just say, so help me God, because hey, it sounds good in movies. It's not what it's for. When you got people wearing body armor, when you got people wearing camouflage to go into danger areas, and they have to wear camouflage because there's people out there that are looking for them to shoot them in the head and kill them, the one person, the one entity that we can go to when everybody else has failed us is the great legislator of the universe, right? There's a saying, there's no, there's no atheist in a foxhole or in the Marine Corps, there's no atheist in a fighting hole. Marines don't use foxholes, they use fighting holes. <laughs> but even if you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, right? One thing that we should all agree on 
is that if everybody just aspires to the idea that there's some type of higher power out there other than just the people in office and that there's some kind of judgment that somehow in one shape, form, fashion or another in this life or the next we're all going to reap some kind of judgment well then it's very likely that people out there whether they're Christians or not or Buddhists or Hindus or atheists or whatever if they just kind of believe that at all or even, or even think it might be possible well then maybe they'll exercise good stewardship that we've entrusted them with when we go to the polls and ask them to go to Jefferson City or Washington DC to protect our liberty. The oath is very, very serious and it has lots of consequences. And for the people who stand up and, and, and acknowledge the logic and the law and the grammatical truths of our oath, it has a whole deeper meaning than the people who take a, who, who say these words and they're just a shell of the kind of American that they should be and take part in our electoral process and our policy making, our election process. People who really understand this oath are gonna do everything they can to ensure that we have liberty, whether they're active, duty, military, reserve, or retired. There's a bumper sticker that I saw a long time ago. It said, freedom isn't free. And a lot of times in America, people say, yeah, freedom's not free. Thank the truth, thank the truth, because freedom's not free. But you see, here's the problem with this. If all we had to do to rely on our freedom was just the fact that some people were wearing the uniform and they were the ones giving us our freedom, then freedom would be free. All right? If you don't have to sacrifice anything for freedom because you think that the guys in the military are doing all the sacrificing, then freedom is free because you're not sacrificing anything for it. But freedom isn't free. And that means that every time you have an opportunity to go to the polls, you have, a, you have an individual responsibility as an American, as somebody who's supposed to practice good stewardship of the freedom and the liberty that God gave you, you have a responsibility to go to the polls. Amen, you have a responsibility. This is, is it, when I was a, when I was candidate, uh, when I was a candidate working for office, I would go knock on a door and I'd talk to somebody and we'd agree on all kinds of stuff. They'd be like, yeah, Paul, you're just the kind of person we need in office. We need more people like you. That's great. I'm so glad I got to meet you. Can you do me a favor? Can I put a yard sign in your yard? It would really help me out. Oh, no. I don't do yard signs. I'm afraid what my neighbors might think. If I put a yard sign in my yard, somebody might say, oh, that, that guy's crazy. Um, I'm going to tell his boss. You know what? We have people that are wearing 80 pound rucksacks climbing the mountains of Afghanistan right now. And regardless of what you think about the wars, these young men and women are over there doing something just so we don't have to do it. Okay? So I would say this. If those people are sacrificing time away from their families, if they're wearing the body armor so we don't have to anymore, if they're carrying the rucksack up and down hills, if they're sacrificing four years of their life, and in some cases, their arms and their legs. And in some cases, they're giving the ultimate sacrifice by giving their life. I think that it's very, that, that putting a yard sign in your yard for candidate pales in comparison to one of our troop members who's overseers right now. Amen. And I would say, I would say, if you've ever been one of those people and you're like, well, I don't really get involved in campaigns. If you're an oath keeper, you better be involved in every single campaign because your oath doesn't just apply so long as you're carrying a rifle. It applies so long as you're living and have the ability to operate in the American system, in the American process of government. That's part of the oath. And so I would say that freedom isn't free, not because it's just because of the troops, but freedom isn't free because we have to sacrifice something too. Thomas Jefferson once said that the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and for government to gain ground. That's the natural thing. The natural thing is for liberty to yield. The natural thing is for people to walk away from the electoral process. The natural thing is for people to turn the television from C-SPAN to American Idol. That's the natural thing. Exactly. The natural thing is when it's a nice day and you can go on vacation, the natural thing is for people to want to spend time with their families, enjoy some beautiful weather, if the, even if it means they don't have to vote. That's the natural thing. Thomas Jefferson warned us that the natural progress is for government to ye or sorry for government to gain ground and for our liberty to yield. What this means is, is that if we want to correct the path that we're on in America, we have to start doing some things that might seem unnatural at first. That means when you have a beautiful day and all your friends are going to play golf, 
but you know that there's a meeting going on on the other side of town because your city council is about ready to implement a policy that's going to help deprive you of your property rights, it is in your best interest, it is in the interest of your property to make sure that you tell your golf buddies, no, I'm sorry, there's bigger fish to fry today. The natural progress is for you to want to go play golf. But if you want to hold on to your liberty, you're going to have to step outside that natural box and you're going to have to start doing something that you normally might feel uncomfortable doing, even if it means going to a town hall meeting, getting in front of a microphone, and speaking out against the horrible policies that your government's about to implement. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And anybody who's been in the military knows this. You know that the difference between accomplishing your mission and being an absolute failure, sometimes, sometimes certain circumstances play into that, but sometimes they're all hinges on whether or not you have a good squad leader or a bad squad leader, right? So right now in America, everything rises and falls on leadership. <coughs> Businesses rise and falls on, fall on leadership. Whole countries rise and fall on leadership. And in America, we have a government by the people and for the people. Barack Obama is not our leader. Congress is not our leader. The American people are supposed to be the leader. Amen. And the natural progress is for us to not want to lead because we would rather engage in some entertainment. But what we need to do in America right now is make sure that we're in every single meeting we can be at. Make sure that our freedom and our liberty is being guarded. Whether someone's a Democrat or a Republican, just make sure that, make sure that whatever they're doing is for the protection of our freedom and for the implementation and for advocating sound financial principles. I think I can make a very good argument to say that more of our liberty has been robbed through our pocketbook than because some congressman or some Yahoo in Jefferson City decided to introduce a bill to ban our guns. Because yeah, we're all going to get excited about that, but sometimes some of the more mundane policies like economic development, people's eyes tend to glaze over because it seems all like it's all just way over our head. But we have to get involved in all these issues and understand it. Because as oath takers, as oath members, it is incumbent upon us to understand these issues and be able to articulate them through the filter of liberty in order to be a light to the other people who just haven't come to that understanding of freedom just yet. Two years ago, I voted on a bill in Jefferson City, and me and one other guy voted no. If you've been to Jefferson City and you've seen us vote, there's a huge board on the left and there's a huge board on the right. And as we vote, if you vote for the bill, your name lights up green. If you vote against the bill, your name turns red. We introduced a bill that was a horrible bill, full of red tape, full of taxes, full of brand new mandates. And I looked at my friend, I said, I think I'm going to be the only guy that votes no on this. And he said, well, I'm voting no. If you vote no, I said, well, I'm voting no. We were the last two people to vote. Everybody else had voted yes. It was almost unanimous. I hit the no button. My friend Andrew Kennedy hit the no button. And then about 15, 16, 17 other people who had already voted yes changed their vote to no. Sometimes leaders need leadership. It's starting to rain right now, so I'm going to be done here. But thank you very much for your time. Hey. And also, if anybody wants one of my books, don't tread on me. I got those available right over here in my car.